Yeah, I have made at least four people add this book on their to be read list and then subsequently convince them to take it back off. Hey, thank you for joining the Escape With Me book club. Escape with me, Sam Reiner. And me, Hannah Rossell. Into our most recent read. Come with us as we evade reality and go into detail about a new book. We'll be covering the book from beginning to end, so there will be spoilers. Today we're going to Oxford, England, and then somewhere randomly in France, and then America. It's all good. Published in February 2011, A Discovery of Witches is the first in the All Souls trilogy. Diana's world is turned upside down when she accidentally discovers a long lost enchanted book. Now, she finds herself the center of attention of all magical creatures and possibly a centuries-old prophecy. With war on the horizon, survival becomes the number one goal. So this was a recommendation for us by a family member of mine. Uh, regerts? <laughs> no regerts. Some regerts. <laughs> Just a few. And some concerns. Also fair. The psychologist in me is screaming. But that is how this book came into our lives, is it was a recommendation and regrets. <laughs> so age level, this is an adult book. Yes. I have a paragraph for the content warning. <laughs> Uh, yeah. And thinking about it, because I always do it as I go along. I type it in. I'm like, oh, this is a thing. Oh, this is a thing. So when I go back and think about it, there aren't too many that pops up. But when I look at the list, I'm like, oh, yeah, there is a lot of stuff. There is a lot of stuff. <laughs> so if you are a person that doesn't like one of the following, this book is not for you. <laughs> Murder, sexual assault, racism, graphic violence, mental illness, panic attacks, and PTSD, specifically. Toxic relationship, both romantic and family. Nudity, blood, animal cruelty, sex, it doesn't happen, but it's descriptive enough. Torture, suicidal ideations is mentioned, and needles. So yeah. It's a lot. It's a lot. And some of it's handled better than others. Yes. So to judge a book by its cover, I don't know. There's like witches and mystery. The cover doesn't really give much away. Yeah, you see like a city on the bottom, but don't really know what you're getting into. It doesn't really give away that it's going to be contemporary fantasy or that there's going to be vampires. I did not know that. Yeah. When it was recommended to me, the recommendation was mainly focused focused on the second and third book. So I didn't actually know much about this series going into it. And the cover is kind of generic. Yeah. The only reason I knew it was a fantasy book is it's called A Discovery of Witches. Otherwise, you could have easily have looked at it and thought, oh, like Da Vinci Code or something like that. You could have. I can see that. It has a lot of symbols on it that I just don't even understand. I mean, I see the Zodiac. I got that. But that's about it. Zodiac Killer. There we go. Mystery. <laughs> Yes. That's what we're doing here. <laughs> yeah. It's not much to say. The font's okay. Very basic, but I mean, it works. <sighs> yeah, the marketer in me is a little disappointed, actually. The font saddens me. Anyway. It's not much about the cover. It's a good cover. It does its job well. Yeah, I don't really have much else to say <laughs> about the cover. Yep. I'm trying so hard. It was published by Penguin, so... There we go. Yeah. I was looking at a hard copy in Barnes and Noble, and I would look at this book in the store and be like, what is this? Yeah, I don't think it would have really grabbed me and been like, yeah, I should look into this. Yeah, definitely not. And as I have learned, it's very dangerous when you pick up a book and it's like New York Times number one bestselling author and not New York Times bestselling book. That is dangerous. <laughs> I have learned my lesson on that. Because uh, I have been duped with that before. Wait. Okay, some of these have a golden seal on it. Is that just announcing that there's a TV show? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's going into its third season. Oh, and there's a TV show cover that's even more generic. I actually hate the TV show cover even more. Oh, is it bad? It's boring. Oh. It's just her, the actress that plays the main character, looking at you with a really weird expression. I can't even begin to describe it. And then I guess the person that plays the love interest 
exist. Uh huh. Except supposedly they're both mega attractive, but it's not a great picture of them. He doesn't look like how I envisioned the love interest at all. Yeah. And then they're surrounded by smoke, and that's it. That's boring. And the font is even more basic. <laughs> <laughs> but apparently, it is a New York Times number one bestseller book. So you can be duped by the New York Times bestseller list too. Nothing is safe. <laughs> Nothing is sacred. Oh, the actress does look how I imagined Diana looking at other clips from the show. Yeah, it's just the cover. They made her do a really weird expression. Yeah, like the universal WTF expression. Basically, which granted, fair. (laughs) Granted, that alternate title, universal WTF. But Matthew's expression is weirder. And also, I just don't see him being played by that actor. I don't know who would play him, but not him. I don't know. But that's a different conversation. Probably. I just don't agree with it. But to stop putting off talking about the book. (laughs) (laughs) I worry I made the summary far more interesting than the book itself. (laughs) That wouldn't be hard. Because I'm like, yeah, survival, an enchanted book, and centuries-old prophecies, and yeah they're in there when you cut out all the fluff it is really interesting but mostly this is just adult twilight (laughs) i had the same note i was like this is just twilight without the sparkles it really is <laughs> okay so we have a policy on the podcast where the two readers are not allowed to talk about the book to each other before we sit down and talk about it but you will remember several weeks ago when I just randomly texted you and I was like hey what did you think of the Twilight series <laughs> and you were like oh I liked it I was like okay just just checking and you were like do I get to know why you asked this and it was like no I understand but I was also a seven grader reading it so ooh, so this is gonna be controversial for all of its flaws twilight did it better i haven't reread twilight but yeah i feel like there is more sustenance in it from what i recall and i kept just placing edward in this world no carlisle that's who Matthew made me of. Oh, I love Carlisle. Okay, big thing is like, oh, there's this huge age gap, blah, 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 whatever. It's vampires. It's fine, guys. That's always going to happen. That's the vampire thing. Yes. And I actually have a very interesting take on that, and we will talk about that, why it's always like that. But anyway. Oh, yay. We'll get to there. Probably when I get tired of talking about this book. <laughs> But Twilight is better because it's not a 35-year-old PhD person. Thank you. I'm sorry, I can't yell. I have neighbors. Thank you. Literally, one of my notes is like, Diana, girl. I actually Googled it. Google says she's 33. Really? Because the book says she's 35. Well, no, it had her birthday and I calculated what it would be. Yeah, see, I calculated it too, but then I Googled it because this came out in 2011. So she was born August 13th, 1976. Yeah. So when it came out in 2011, she would have been either 35 or soon to be 35. Interesting. I wonder where Google got 33. I don't know. Maybe it's actually set in 2009. Maybe. I don't know. But I would rant to people and send screenshots of clips of the book to people. And some of the people knew from the beginning what I was talking about. And then some people I started ranting halfway through because they were like, hey, what are you doing? And then I was like, well, this book is my life right now. So uh, I hope you're ready to hear about that. Okay, so Wiki Fandom says she's 33. But this might be for the TV show. Maybe. Either way, she is too old for this. Yeah, she's way too old. So that was the thing. So people that knew from the beginning they're like okay wow good job diana but there were people that i started ranting halfway through and they were like okay whatever and then at one point i was like did i mention this is a 35 year old woman and they're like what you are in your 30s you're a professor a whole entire phd holding professor works at yale multi-published author is a guest professor at Oxford is skilled enough to be keynote speaking at major events. Graduated high school at 16. Why are you acting like this, Diana? Why are you acting like a 17-year-old? 
I constantly was like, she is acting like an undergraduate student. She's acting like a 17-year-old Bella Swan. Yes. And at some points, I can understand maybe that's not like a knee-jerk, but like an instinctual reaction, but not the whole entire book. But there are so many things she does, and we will get to some of them. (laughs) But she does things. And it would make sense if it was a 17-year-old. That didn't have a fully formed brain. Whose emotions are still going haywire because hormones. And their frontal cortex has not fully developed. But I feel like it's all explained away by like, she's been repressing her magic for so long. Oh my god. <laughs> 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 Uh, my number two problem with this book is magic hormones for them oh no 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 we're gonna have Uh, we (laughs) one at a time i cannot we will get there she's a witch we're not even gonna talk about her magic for a while okay someone's mad spicy on a side note one of the friends that i was ranting to follows me on goodreads and i gave this book a two star and she got mad at me (laughs) oh boy because she was like you ranted to me for so long and you (laughs) dare to give this two stars (laughs) so i'll just go in saying this book doesn't make me angry that it exists yeah because i have read books like that and i've just been angry (laughs) but i am going to rant like this book is a one star (laughs) Because I need the cathartic experience of it. Yeah. It had such good promise. It sounded so cool. And then just, nope, boom, teenager, but she's actually 30 something. Honestly, this book reminds me of, have you ever read a trilogy? And the second book is just filler to get to the third book so that the author could have a trilogy? Yes. It's that. But the first book. Exactly. Did she write the other two books? I was like, I need to explain how all this happened. Because let's talk about bare bones what the plot is. Let's go. She finds an enchanted book. She gives the enchanted book back. A vampire falls in love with her. Everyone hates that a vampire has fallen in love with her. It's against their counsel. Mysterious government being anti-relationship. Wonder where they got that from. Hmm. The description of this book calls it inventive, and I actually would like to make a case that this is just derivative Twilight. Yeah. We will get to all my points, though. Because in 2011, all the books are out, and I think the first movie is out. So I'm just saying. Yeah, it's right around that time. Or I'm, I'm wondering if trying to get the twi-heart 30-year-old mom crowd and that's why she's in her 30s is all I'm saying. Maybe. The marketer in me is suspicious. <laughs> but they're not cool with that and so they go to France to meet his family and guess what? They're still not cool with that. So then they go to America to meet her family and guess what? They're still not cool with that. So they're gonna go tied in time and that's it. That's the entire book. Credit. We did this in what, 20 minutes? She could have done that in like a chapter, and yet she did it in 500 pages. Specifically, 579. I'm not kidding when I said this book had to be my life for a little bit. It was so freaking long. And I have an issue. Just one? With fantasy. I have a bone to pick with fantasy as a genre. I am so tired of 600 page books. With a 300-page story. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with a 600-page book if it's good the entire time. It isn't just describing a house for an entire chapter. Because here's the thing. Publishing industry. A normal book, 50,000 words, is average. So, you know, like NaNoWriMo or whatever is like, hey, that's about the size of a novel. Minimum word count for fantasy is 80,000. Jeez. And the range they expect to have is 80,000 to 120. Why are there so many words? These people do not have 80,000 words that are good. They have 50,000. That's okay. No. Ah. Anyway, (laughs) that has been my problem with so many fantasy books. I'm like, this book would be infinitely better if I cut 200, 300 pages. Oh, yeah. I didn't need some details. That is this book. Okay, let's talk about Oxford for a little bit. To give an example, this author describes every single meal they have in 
painstaking detail. Oh my god, she did. There is not a single meal in this entire book I think is skipped. I didn't realize that. Oh my gosh. They eat so much much i mean it's a normal human thing but yeah every meal was just so fantastic oh gosh (laughs) some books you read food and you're like gosh i'm hungry and then this one how did she make food sound so bad yeah not once was i reading it and i was like hmm i really want that now i'm hungry not once was i reading this i was like oh yeah i could really go for some venison or whatever it was non-cooked venison oh my god And also, granted, I will get my bias. I am not a wine drinker, but my goodness, they sound like alcoholics. I'm so glad I'm not the only one that thought that. I don't understand as a concept, as a trope, why vampires drink wine. Can we just have a vampire who like really likes root beer and has tried every different type there is throughout history? I just don't understand because it's like, oh, it looks like blood, but it doesn't taste like it. No. It's grapes. <laughs> I know. There's like one, she's like, oh, it smells like the ocean. I was like, have you ever actually smelled wine? It smells like expired grapes. That's what it is. Oh my gosh. Some of the things i'm like is this supposed to be good she was smelling something she's like oh it smells like old cigars and cleaning out the pencil sharpener in second grade i'm like that sounds nasty yeah i wouldn't want to taste it oh this tastes like it was some sort of bear like cranberries and chalk oh yeah It was some sort of berry. Maybe it's just because we're not big wine people. I don't know. But some of the things I was just like, what in the world? Well, I asked people that were into wine. And maybe we're just all poor and can't afford the expensive wine that tastes amazing. So we're all chipping in like 50 to 100 each. And we're going to go buy some really expensive wine to see if it lives up to the hype. So everyone just is like, that sounds terrible. If it doesn't smell like oddly specific things i don't want it (laughs) clearly (laughs) and oh my gosh she ripped off ratatouille did she the second date they go on okay so they go on a first date and the entire chapter is diana buying the food diana cooking the food diana complaining about how expensive the wine was (laughs) and then every single course and how diana reacts to the food and then how he reacts to the food it's like i don't give a flip god can we romance she could not even romance properly. <laughs> this is the slow burn, the cringe slow burn. And so to pay her back, Matthew does the same thing and cooks dinner for her. But every single course, and there's at least four courses, which I as a person do not understand courses. Besides, oh, here's an appetizer. Here's an entree. But they're like, no, we're going to have a salad and then we're going to have seafood and then we're going to have venison. And I'm like, what is happening? I mean, I sort of understand why she did it because it was the whole learning how to cook for a vampire thing. Yeah. And she was like, I don't know how to do this. Except she doesn't. So it's not actually educational. Yeah. I don't think I needed this much detail no. about how she learned all these recipes from Google and the freaking zoology department. Oh my gosh. I called the zoology department and was like, what do wolves eat? And what was this thing with chestnuts? Why do they like chestnuts so much? I have a lot of questions about why she was so obsessed with making vampires and wolves the same thing. I was half expecting werewolves to come in. Oh yeah, I was like, where are the werewolves? Hmm? Team Jacob, let's go. No, vampires just eat the same thing as wolves. Which is weird. Question mark. Anyway, the second date, instead of the reactions of both of them, it is literally, hey, eat that food. Okay, now drink this wine. So she takes takes a bite of the food, she sniffs the wine, she takes a sip of the wine, and then she talks about the combination of the two. Repeat four times. Oh my goodness. Ratatouille did it first. Ratatouille did it better. (laughs) Yeah, I didn't even realize. Man, I need to go watch that movie. It's such a good scene. Ah, but no, we have to do that with nasty wine and non-cooked meat. And oysters. I don't know if you've ever had oysters, but that texture is disgusting. Even people that like oysters are like, yeah, the texture is something you have to overcome. Mm -mm, Never. I did it once and I know 
No. My husband on our honeymoon had escargot and he really liked it. I'm a textures girl. Yeah, I have texture issues and it honestly wasn't that bad. Have you ever had fried conch? Disgusting. It's like chewing salty rubber, but it also has a weird texture of almost like oysters, but a little harder to chew. No. I'm allergic to shellfish, so I've never had anything like that, but it doesn't smell good. I think my soul left my body when I tried it, truly. But at least you tried it. Yes. So if that experience had happened in this book, though... <laughs> it would have been the best. It would have been such a creamy texture. Ugh. And it would have been for four pages. And drink this oddly specific wine that tastes like the ocean or something. <laughs> And they're just constantly drinking it. Okay, at first, the second date, I didn't realize (laughs) that they were only having one glass with each course. (laughs) Because he goes downstairs and gets four bottles of wine. Which, first of all, he uses a ridiculously vintage, old, really expensive, one-of-a-kind, you-can't-find-this-wine-anywhere on their first freaking date, man. Like, that's the stuff you save for weddings. Right. Goodness. Well... I mean, what wedding? Oh, um, I'll get there. <laughs> we're not in France yet. We're in Oxford. But I didn't realize they were only having one glass. And so I thought they were drinking an entire bottle <laughs> with these cores. And I was like, what is wrong <laughs> with these people? They're teeny tiny bottles. They're tiny. <laughs> but then they were like, okay, it's just a glass. I was like, okay, that's better. But also, maybe I'm just not fancy. That just seems like a waste of wine. You can have a glass with your cores. Well, that's it. We're not gonna drink anything else from this bottle I've already opened. Yeah, the centuries old wine. And you go and drink a glass. You get one glass and the rest of it's gonna go bad. Ugh. But we don't think about that. Oh, he has enough money. It's fine. Yeah, he has his own private collection of wines in this college. I have questions. (laughs) Anyway, talking about the monotony, there are four scenes of her rowing exercises and only one of the scenes does anything happen. So you get three to four pages of her rowing exercises and all the thoughts in her brain and nothing happens. But oh my goodness, is she going to tell you about every time Diana goes to exercise with rowing? I feel like she wrote the book with one or two rowing scenes and then her editor was like, "Mm, we need more in this book. So she's like, "Mm, let's add some details and some rowing scenes to really spice things up. I know so much about Diana that I did not need to know. Also, possibly some anti-medication rhetoric. Yeah. That made me a little bit uncomfortable. Yeah. Diana is very anti-medicine. Yeah, which is interesting. Whether that be anti-anxiety medicine or that be vaccines to save her freaking life. Yeah. I can get the anti-anxiety meds, whatever. She said she tried one and that's always the rhetoric, isn't it? I tried one and it didn't work immediately, so. so it takes a while. And uh, it's so unhealthy. She's like, yeah, I exercise now to keep the panic attacks away. And it works so well. And I'm like, if you got injured, you would be screwed. Oh my gosh, yeah. And so yeah, I totally am down for anyone who can do it on their own. Diet, exercise, they make lifestyle changes so they don't have to be on medicine. That's awesome for you. But you have to spread it out to more than one thing. Because it's like, oh, I only exercise guys. That is the only thing that keeps me sane. As soon as you're injured, you're screwed. Yeah. Or when you get older, like when she's 65, she's not going to be able to go on massive rowing exercises. But the way they explained, oh, once she starts using her magic, it's all better. (laughs) Crazy. (laughs) I mean, I wish I could do that. I wish I could just magic my anxiety away. Oh my gosh. I wish I could magic. I hate this trope. I hate the trope of I'm a wizard or witch or whatever, but I hate magic. I wish I could just... Just be normal. Shut up. No, you don't. You don't want to be normal. Magic is cool as heck. It's like rich people complaining about being rich. Yeah, there's some validity there, I'm sure. Shut up. Right. And it's the entire book. It's the entire book. The entire book. It it was like big pick me energy. Massive pick me energy. Ugh. This is a 35 year old woman. But yeah, she hates magic. I mean, and granted, I guess she sort of has a valid reason to. But she won't shut up about it. 
Yeah. Even when her life is in danger, other people's lives are in danger, everything is going to pot. But I hate magic. Okay, Diana, I understand you hate magic, but I would also hate dying. Thank you very much. I would hate being a liability. Yeah. Thoughts. But to go to the plot, she finds this book. I think it's the first chapter? Yeah, three pages in, she finds this book. It's just like, they don't normally let us get manuscripts this old or something like that. And Diana goes out of her way to explain what a palm pisset is. That sounds like a Pokemon. <laughs> oh my gosh. P-A-L-M-P-S-E-S-T. Pompasset. Yep, that's how I was reading it. And it's a book where there was a book and then they washed the pages and then reused the pages. So it's basically two books in one. It's kind of like when you have a painting and then they paint over the painting and then they take an x-ray and they're like, holy crap, there's a second painting here. So that but books. And then she spends the rest of the book being confused why everyone wants an alchemy manuscript. Right. Why did you go out of your way to be like, hey, there's a second book in here? And then be like, why does everyone want this book? Book. Hmm, Diana, why does everyone want this book? Oh, I wonder if it has to do with the magical words running around and maybe the fact that it's not just an alchemy manuscript. Yeah. Thoughts? Diana, get yourself together, girl. Use that brain. Why did the author do that? Why in the world was the author like, I need to explain what a pompa set is. Now I'm never going to come back to that until the very end. <laughs> you could have just so easily not explained what that is. Or at least not in as much detail. And that way the reader doesn't know. I wouldn't have known that. Yeah, I would have been like, what the heck is this? That is an interesting about of history. So I would also be confused. Confused why everyone wants an alchemy manuscript. Yeah. But no, we know it's a palm visit. Diana, for some reason, can't figure out why everyone wants the mystery. And there's a vampire, and then it just turns into vampire romance. Yeah, it started out so well, and then I got blindsided by a romance. Okay. And the romance isn't even that good. Yeah, this book would have been better without the romance, but whatever. Or if you were gonna make it romance, make it romance. This is such slow burn oh my gosh it's not even a slow burn there's no burn fair enough it's boring do something we had to sit through both of those boring dates just for her to freaking kiss her oh my gosh yes we had to sit through chapter after chapter of him stalking her and then him taking her to yoga and breaking into her house and say what you want about edward keep the energy up is all i'm saying yeah <laughs> break into her house, takes her to yoga, takes her to a diner twice. They go on two really boring dates. <laughs> and by the second time in the diner, they know her normal order, which is very unrealistic. <laughs> Yeah, I'm like, you have no customers, do you? I went to the same Waffle House for four years in college, and they never figured out my normal order. So that is unrealistic. <laughs> it's unrealistic because they're always super busy. And he's like, yeah, after the first time we have your order memorized. It's because she has a crush on Matthew and you know it. Oh, heck yeah. But anyway, so we had to sit through all of that just to get a freaking kiss. Boring. And then Diana's like, are we just friends just friend that's what just friends do diana yes there's a point i think it's in france where she's like oh we crossed the line and we're no longer just friends or something and i'm like what has all of this been up to this point you stopped being just friends a while ago ma'am do you randomly kiss your male friends is this a thing we've passed it you don't have to be like oh we're boyfriend and girlfriend or something like that or we're in a committed relationship but we have passed, friends. You passed that 20,000 chapters ago, ma'am. But then nothing happens for forever after that. Uh, and she does dumb things that I think are supposed to make her quirky. Like she walks around with her eyes closed. Oh my gosh, yes. And she rides the horse with eyes closed and Rose with her eyes closed. And Matthew's like, that's you using magic. And she's like, no, everyone does this, don't they? No. No, Diana. If I walked with my eyes closed, I think I'd break about five different bones. She almost runs into Claremont because her eyes are closed. Yeah. Oh my gosh. 
<sighs> <It's>, <laughs> so much sighing in this episode. The first part of the book is just Claremont being like, hey, you're a witch. You should use your magic. And Diana being like, no, I'm not a witch. I mean, she is a witch, but she's like, no, I don't have magic. I don't use magic. I hate magic. And it's a very realistic portrayal of confronting someone in denial. Yeah. But you know what I also don't like doing in real life? <laughs> Confronting someone in denial. I don't like it in real life. I don't want it in my fantasy. <laughs> but that's all this book is. And then her suddenly be like, I'm going to use magic now. <sighs> but she doesn't even. She doesn't even. There are very few things that I will give praise for for this book series. But I miss in Harry Potter when if you don't use your magic, you explode. <laughs> I forgot about that. <laughs> Can you imagine Diana's just rowing and just... Boom. Explosion. She would have been gone by now, so this book wouldn't have even happened. It's great. <laughs> it's Matthew traveling back to the past to put her back together. He never would have met her. It's perfect. True. It's all good. Anyway, my really saltiest feelings aside, <laughs> this book is also super misogynist, and I think that's my biggest issue with it. Yeah. Because it's not even subtle. Yeah. Every single woman she meets hates her immediately. And is catty. Miriam, the mom. The other witch. Jillian. I mean, even her freaking aunt hates her to an extent. The only women that are nice to her from the beginning and that aren't super catty are women that would not be a romantic rival to her. The housekeeper. So a 60-year-old woman? Fine. A family? Fine. People that are potentially attractive and her same age? Nope. Catty, can't get along, hate each other, pack too much luggage. Oh my gosh. That also happened. There was an entire three paragraph pick me scene where Diana packs a singular bag and Matthew's like, every woman I know packs way too much luggage. Are you going to be fine with just that little amount? And he is impressed with her because she doesn't pack a lot. And she strictly wears trousers, leggings, and turtleneck sweaters. Okay, Steve Jobs. <laughs> Yeah, and it's great. It's wonderful. I love that. Also, she does nothing for herself. Okay, this entire book happens to Diana. Diana doesn't do crap. Yeah, damsel in distress. Even her magic powers happen to her. She doesn't cause them. She doesn't control them. They happen to to her. She's like a teenager with out of control hormones. There is nothing in this book that she does herself. It's all done to her. It's gross. It's just such a helpless narrative. And they go out of their way to be like, oh, she's not a damsel in distress. Immediately is a damsel in distress. Constantly. This is learned helplessness. Absolute trash. But the book starts off with she's doing all this stuff by herself, doing all this pretty intense research. And then all of a sudden, I can't do anything. Nope. I'm going to cry here because he left me. Oh my gosh. Okay, we're not in France yet. And flood a tower. We are not in France yet. <laughs> I'm sorry. We're about to be in France. I have lots of feelings about France. Let me get Oxford out of the way. So she donates her blood. And this was the chapter I had a bit of an epiphany in, mainly because my husband was sitting next to me. And I was like, it's not info dumps because they're doing something. And he's like, what are they doing? I was like, talking to each other. He said, that's an info dump. That's what this book is. Endless info dumping. It is, they go to a place, talk for a chapter. They go to another place, talk for a chapter. They go to another place, flashback, where they talk to each other. Nothing happens. It's just a bunch of talking. It's just a bunch of info dumps. That is the style of this book. It is. Oh my goodness. There is barely any action. They just talk to each other. And then Diana has magic fits. And then they talk to each other. And then she becomes a horse girl. <laughs> but we are not in France yet. She was always a horse girl. Oh my gosh. <laughs> she is fantastic at writing. Oh my gosh. <sighs> are you ready to go to France? Yeah. So she donates her blood. And apparently there's some science there where it's like, oh, witches and vampires have an extra set of chromosomes. And demons? Demons? 
I was reading it as demons because every time I read Damons, I was imagining Damon from Vampire Diaries, and that just was not a good image. Spelled D A E M O N. And so it could be Damons, but it could also be the thing where an author spells a common word slightly different, but it's still the same thing. The narrator, when I was listening to an audiobook, said demons. So. So yeah, it was just being quirky. Okay. So yeah, so that's the science. And so they take her blood, and that's not going to be relevant till the end of the book. And a cheek swab. Yes. For some reason. So many of my notes for the first section are just, why are you daft? It's two books in one. Once again, you know it's actually two books. Stop asking. Oh my goodness. We've gone through this. <laughs> okay, anyway. There's this dude. Peter Knox. He's creepy, I guess. Sort of? I guess he threatens her by existing? Ding. Trying to get into her head? I don't know. And he talks to her, and then he has a image of her parents, who were murdered by witches, she finds out, sent to her room, and that's enough to spur them to... Th- now that I think about it, this was blown really out of proportion. She has a whole panic attack and meltdown, which, okay, fine. Fair. Seeing a colorized picture, because she's only seen it in black and white, seeing a colorized picture of your parents' viciously murdered bodies is a bit jarring. Just a little bit. I can see how that would be some sort of trauma trigger, but I do think the amount she reacted, granted, I'm speaking as someone who doesn't have trauma like that. I was okay with her reaction. I just, now that I'm thinking about it, I don't understand why they were like, we have to leave Oxford right now. We have to go to France. I could see it being really shocking. That was another awkward anti-medicine rant where he gave her a sedative and then she was mad at him for giving her a sedative. Yeah, but also you don't need to trank someone that's having a panic attack. My goodness. Well, I don't know. The way she was going. I think he was worried her magic was going to do something. Well, that too. But like I said, it wasn't that bad. It was a sedative. It was literally, oh, you were asleep for a little while. Your body recovered you're back. This is true. And she was mad at him. And I was just like, hmm, file that away. But also, how high up was her room that they heard her scream? How loud did she scream? I don't know. They're vampires and he's stalking her. But the gate guy heard her too because they both came running into her room. I don't Second floor? I know that she's upstairs, but I don't know anything about Oxford. But it also was like a moan escaped my lips. So I'm like, how'd they hear you? This is another book that thinks you're obsessed with Oxford. Because I keep mentioning places and colleges, and I'm like, this means nothing to me. Truly. And so I don't understand the housing situation. She has a room. I don't know. No, I know nothing. I was just imagining Hogwarts, really. And so Peter Knox is all like, you don't know who you're dealing with. He's sketchy, blah, 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 blah. And there's a weird plot hole where he's like, you should ask your boyfriend about the autumn of 1859. And ask him what he was doing then. But when she asks him, she says, tell me what you were doing except September 1859. And I'm like, how did you know the month? That witch's insight. If somebody said autumn to me, I would have thought October, November. Yeah, not September. So a little bit of a plot hole there. Didn't even catch that. Good job. This is what I do. This is what you do. It's a skill. I don't have it. Or a curse, depending on who you ask. Oh, here's what it was. Sorry, I found the wine note. It's not berries. It was taste of chalk and butterscotch. Neither of which are appealing. I like butterscotch. Chalk sounds terrible. I don't understand. I don't think I've had butterscotch in so long. I actually couldn't tell you. But together. There was another one that was like, it smelled like my father's study after he'd been smoking and of emptying the shavings from the pencil sharpener in second grade. And my husband was like, maybe she means it's woody and smoky. And I'm like, why didn't you just said that? Had a woody and smoky is it's so hard to say. If you've ever smelled cigar smoke, that stuff does not smell good. Yeah, and I've had conversations with people where they point out, well, if you grew up with it, maybe it's attractive scent. Fine. Maybe it's a nostalgic thing. Who thinks emptying the pencil sharpener smells good in combination with cigar smoke? 
No, this smells good, Diana. Why are you doing this, author? Anyway, so they get the blood. Peter Knox scares them, whatever. And then, you know what's the most annoying thing to me? What? Do share. All of these witches that she grew up with. Her parents, her aunt, her aunt's girlfriend, wife. I don't think they ever established. I think it's basically girlfriend, but they never really said it. They said, like, while Diana lived there, they lived in two separate places, but, like, everyone in the town really knew the nature of the relationship. Maybe they're not married. Anyway, it doesn't matter. They're partner. All of these witches, right? But she needs a male vampire to explain to her how magic works. He is clearly the utmost authority on it. Uh, I wanted to throw my phone at the wall. I was reading a Kindle book, so I didn't have the physical copy. (laughs) So I wanted to throw my phone at the wall. Every single time they sat down and pages upon pages, vampire telling a witch how to magic. Because she doesn't want to listen when her aunt explains it. Because no one in her life could possibly explain to her what magic is except for the male vampire. This isn't a complete abuse of the power structure. Not at all. It's not like he has all the money and apparently the knowledge and political sways. This isn't concerning. It's not a total imbalance of power at all. And at some point they mention, oh, vampires aren't allowed to get involved in politics or religion. And then they go out of their way to talk about how Matthew was in the Revolutionary War and how vampires fought for France. And they were a group of knights crusading. How is this not getting involved in politics? Subtle politic involvement. Subtle. (laughs) (laughs) With lots of quotation marks. This is where, first of all, the relationship is massive. Massively codependent. Oh, yeah. And I don't understand Diana's hatred of her aunts. It's like she's a teenager. It's like she hates them. It's one thing to be like, in the beginning, it was like, oh, yeah, they're being a little overbearing, calling all the time, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. But she is being threatened by a wizard. And the first thing Matthew says is, hey, we should go to your aunts because magic. And she's like, no. And so he's like, okay, let me take you to my mother who absolutely hates and murders witches all the time. Yes. Yeah. Maybe she didn't want to worry them. Girl, they're already worried, so... They know. They have premonitions. They know what's going on. Just a long sigh. That's all I have for that. (laughs) But she really does act like she hates them, and I don't understand. The entire book. Just, I don't know. It was weird. They haven't done anything. It's not like they're just no ants. They seem like lovely people that actually care about her and would know stuff about magic. Until you get there and then you find out, oh no, they can't help with magic. Matthew has to help her go magic. Yes, he's the utmost authority on magic. Wanted to throw my phone at the wall. I wanted to stress test my otter box. (laughs) And so it's so codependent. And it's not even romantic. Yeah. It's a really unhealthy relationship 101. Yeah. So they decide to go to France. So we're in France now. Woo. <sighs> I think France is my least favorite section. Thinking about this logically, Oxford's probably the weakest link here, but I still had patience for it in the beginning because I didn't know where it was going to go. And so by the time we got to France, I was just done with patience. Yeah. So France is my least favorite section. It's really where she just tumbles into the damsel in distress. And she can't do anything unless Matthew says so. And I don't understand. And the mom goes out of her way to be like, oh, you have to listen to him because we're vampires and apparently vampires are patriarchal. Yeah. That actually doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Because the reason the patriarchy was like, hey, we should do that is always because, oh, women are weak and can't do it. That's like the key base assumption. But vampire women can get it. They really can. Yeah, there's being old fashioned. And yeah, I could totally see a vampire from Matthew's time being misogynist. But I don't understand everyone just putting up with it. Yeah, I also have thoughts about his mom and how she became a vampire. His 
mom could have been so cool. This witch hater, vicious, powerful woman. Because she's jealous of them and their ability to die. And their ability to magic. And what's weird is they give that excuse and then later on they give a different excuse. It's like the author was like, this isn't a good enough reason for her to hate witches. This isn't good enough. So then they gave a backstory. It's like, oh, the love of my life was murdered by witches because Nazis? And apparently witches and Nazis were working together but also he turned her into a vampire without asking her first which i'm like how are you still madly in love with him because vampires and if you miss him that much just go revive him or something i don't know how vampire magic works well that was the problem is they couldn't find him oh yeah true because the witches were like Meh, you can't find him and so that's why she killed a bunch of nazis and witches and so it's totally justified guys she's actually not a bad person she killed Nazis. So she's a good person. And I'm just like, "Mm, give me my villain. (laughs) Give me my Cruella de Vil. Give me the woman that's powerful. It was fine. But no, we immediately have to make her weak and fawn over Diana because Diana is the wonderful horse girl. Yes. Which, by the way, there are horses in France and cue four chapters of just horse stuff. So much horse stuff. I was not a horse girl. Growing up, I was friends with someone who really liked horses, but she was not the stereotypical horse girl. Diana's a stereotypical horse girl. Yeah. It just came out of nowhere. Yeah, she was just like, oh, yeah, I totally rode horses. This is like 250 pages in. And she's like, yeah, I totally rode horses growing up. And I was just like, is this secretly a YA? (laughs) This is around the point where I was like, legitimately, why did you write adult book? This is YA. Yeah. Bella just found her horse. Bella became a horse girl. Bella became a horse girl. Going back to her hating her aunts, Mm -hmm. she even specifically says when the mom starts liking her, quote, I felt so good and I was glad to finally be part of a family again, end quote. Like, you haven't been part of a family for the past 30-something years? What is the hatred? There is nothing in the dynamic that speaks to, oh, They act like we're close, but we're not close. There is nothing in the backstory or their interactions that comes across. She just hates her aunts. Yeah, is it because they tried to get her to use magic and she just resents them for that or something? I have no idea. I honestly don't know. And it's like, oh yeah, they have prejudices, so they're terrible, but it's... Isabel? Is it Isabel? I don't know. Is, I don't know. The mom hates witches, but that's fine. Yeah, totally fine. That doesn't count. Overlooking racism when it's convenient. And the dialogue is also really stilted. Their conversations don't follow a natural flow. They'll just randomly say sentences to change the topic. And it has nothing to do with what was just said. I don't, I'm just confused. <laughs> but also, Diana's an idiot. Here's an example. <laughs> Supposedly one of her magical powers is empathy, by the way. She's just so empathetic. Where? (laughs) Where? Where is the empathy, Diana? So here's an example. Apparently vampires have like a thousand and one names. Okay, that's an addition to lore. Yeah. And one of the love interest Matthew's names is his father's name. The father that died in a very traumatic way. And so the mom's just like, so he'll go by any of his names, but not Philip. And Diana's like, why wouldn't he want to go by Philip? I just can't understand why he wouldn't want to go by that name. Because his dad is dead. (sighs) Where is that empathy, Diana? You ignoramus. Where is? the sense. What are his other names? His full name is Matthew Gabriel Philip Bertrand Bertrand? 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 Sebastian de Clermont. He was also a very good Sebastian and a passable Gabriel. He hates Bertrand and he will not answer to Philip. Diana, what is it about Philip that bothers him? 
dummy. Just gonna let you think about what you said, Diana. Just think about it for a minute. And the answer wasn't that he was dead. It was some other random answer. Like, her question was totally justified. Whatever. Oh, here's another wine one. Oh, oh boy. This is the one I was thinking about when I was thinking about berries. Okay. Quote, he poured two glasses and carried one to me before he sat down. I sniffed, anticipating his first question. Raspberry and rocks. I forgot. What do rocks smell like? What type of rocks? What does she mean by that? Raspberry. Okay, that's standard. Okay, whatever. I guess you can put raspberries in wine. I don't really know. But rocks? Rocks. Rocks. Do I just need to go sniff Stone Mountain the next time I'm in Georgia and be like, yeah, that's what a rock smells like. What does a rock taste like? It depends on the rock. This is true. Like, I have questions. Raspberries? We can just talk about, oh, what type of raspberries? There's like three. There's a lot of different types of, like, gravel? That's truly what I imagined when she said rocks. I was like, why would there be gravel smelling stuff? I have no idea. Are you talking like fancy rocks? Gemstone sort of rocks? But why rocks? So here's an example. I'm just going to read the dialogue. I'm not going to read the in-between paragraph stuff, because that would take forever. Forever. Yeah. So this is how the dialogue goes. Diana, do these things just happen to witches? Electrical fires and winds? They didn't summon? Matthew, witch winds and blue fingers are rare these days. There's magic inside you, Diana, and it wants to get out, whether you ask for it or not. Diana, I felt trapped. Matthew, I shouldn't have cornered you last night. It's so stilted. Yeah. Yeah, that one I was like, huh? It felt like it was checking off boxes of conversation versus being a conversation. There's so much missing. It felt like it was a purpose instead of a conversation. Yeah, and a weird attempt at character development, maybe? I don't know. None of them felt natural. Yeah. Like I said, it just felt stilted. And then that's all this book is, is dialogue. Yeah. So if you can't do that right, if you actually listen listen to that and you were like that wasn't so bad you might enjoy the book more than I did because you really would be like for example like oh it's super rare for someone to be able to control that stuff nowadays I felt trapped I shouldn't have cornered you last night (laughs) what (laughs) both of you what is happening I feel like I was just getting whiplash in some of these conversations. Also, the I shouldn't have cornered you last night. It was something super pedantic. She makes such a big deal out of some really little stuff sometimes. And then she makes no deals about the big stuff. And it just feels like feminist lip service than actually trying to say something. How to say nothing but with 10,000 words. For real. So France, Diana becomes friends with a mom or whatever, and then she becomes super codependent on Matthew to the point, bringing up what you brought up earlier. Ah, yes. Matthew leaves to go to Oxford to take care of some business. Of Peter. He's not leaving forever. He's leaving for probably three days. This is after she's been crushed with him being like, we can't have this relationship. It's against the congregation or whatever. And blah, 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 blah. But seriously, he is leaving for three days. And she has a meltdown. Truly. It is embarrassing. It was pretty okay. She starts having witch water and water just flows out of her because she's crying so hard because he's leaving her. And she starts drowning herself. Oh my gosh. They're not going to be together, girl. You were fine. You didn't know this dude two weeks ago and the thought of him leaving you for three days causes you an absolute breakdown. Yeah, that's a red flag. That's a several red flags. This is not healthy. No, not at all. This is not okay. You are a 35-year-old woman. And it's not to be like, oh, she can't be upset or miss him or anything. But that's not what this is. No, and I'd understand if she'd be nervous about him going to confront all this Oxford stuff. And if she was worried for him, But she's worried about how it's going to affect her. It's so egocentric. And it's so bonkers. It is a literal mental breakdown because he's going to be gone for like three days. Yeah. Are you sure you're not 17? Freaky Friday. At least when Edward left a new moon, she thought he wasn't coming back. All I'm saying. Yeah. It's excessive. It never came across as like, I'm never coming back or I'm going to be gone for a really long time. Long time. At no 
point did it feel like that. It was like, oh, he has to go handle this and then he'll probably be back. Meltdown. Embarrassing. Oh my goodness. And she's like, I didn't know I had the power to do that. These powers just keep happening. And it's like, oh my gosh. Oh, and I'm not going to try to learn to control it because that would be responsible. Nope. Just going to let it keep happening to me for another third of the book. Be a complete liability. Totally just endangering everyone around me. But I hate magic in the corner. For some reason, his mom has to explain to her what the congregation is. And I feel like that was really irresponsible of Sarah and him to not explain that to her. Yeah, but they're like, well, you don't use magic, so we didn't have to explain the essential functioning of our society to you. Even if she doesn't use magic, she's still a witch and under their governance. Why is a vampire having to explain to her how witches work? Okay, so the vampire allows gets broken into and it takes diana so long to be like wait it wasn't humans that tried to break into the lab (sighs) because humans could totally totally do that and would have a reason to no dummy even though they're in total denial of the existence of these other creatures of course it wasn't a human you're being hunted down by the congregation with vampires and witches and we're gonna ignore the demons i'm actually really mad about that witches and vampires aren't nearly as interesting as the demons the demons sounded so cool yeah that was the only inventive thing here but let's completely ignore them in favor for tired tropes about witches and vampires okay they're not important. Why even put them in? You actually could have taken them out and it would not have mattered. Hamish could have just been a whole nother vampire. Yep. Maybe they play a bigger part in the second and third book? Yeah, but this was the starter book and that's why I'm mad. And granted she had two other really popular books so she could have had a trilogy contract going into it. But I always like to look at books like what if this had been the only one? Oh geez, that would have been bad. And that really says something about the book, doesn't it? If for some reason it hadn't sold or she didn't have this trilogy contract and so she had to do it by merit alone. If this had been the only book. Yeah, it wouldn't have been a trilogy. Because I've read trilogies and duologies and ones that are forever long. For example, series of unfortunate events, 13 books. You could read the first book by itself and be satisfied. You could. You could not do that with this book. No. It almost forces you into reading more. And it has not proven to me it deserves that. I am a slow reader. I am very picky on the books I read because of that. This has not proven that it deserves that. As a completionist, too, I've read plenty of bad books just because I wanted to complete the series. But if this second book is anything like the first book, I think I would go mad. But to kind of go back to the powers a little bit, you find out in France that her parents put a spell on her that she can't use her magic. And so it's not that Diana hates magic, even though it's totally that Diana hates magic. It's that she's been spellbound and she can't use her magic. Because her parents are trying to protect her or something, I guess. I still have questions. Doesn't seem like a well thought out plan. But it just sets up this dichotomy that Diana is emotional and Matthew is logical. Yes. Which is my favorite trope. Yay. Women with their freaking emotions. They can't think straight. They can't be leaders. No. Not at all. No, never. Can't be trusted with their own magic. They can't be trusted to do anything. I love, I love, I love this author so much and how much she loves women. <laughs> the Declaremont family apparently has different skill sets in a crisis. That is a direct quote, by the way. Philip had always been the leader of men, a charismatic figure who could convince vampires and humans and sometimes even demons to fight for a common cause. Their brother Hugh had been the negotiator, bringing warring sides to the bargaining table and resolving even the fiercest of conflicts. Godfrey, the youngest of Philip's three sons, had been their conscience, teasing out the ethical implications of every decision. To Baldwin fell the battle strategies, his sharp mind quick to analyze every plan for flaws and weaknesses. Louisa, their only sister, had been useful as bait. Or as a spy, depending on the situation. 
are you kidding me? And didn't Louisa also fall prey to all the whims of the time or whatever they said? And that's why she got killed? Yep. She was emotional. She was illogical. She was a terrible person because every woman that could potentially be a rival for Diana is a terrible person. Yes. Even though that's his own sister, but whatever. But yeah, no, she was useful as bait. All of these other men with sentences, you couldn't have just been like, she was a great spy and teased that out. No, the first thing that they they want you to know about Louisa is that she is useful as bait. And then they talk about the mother in a different paragraph and they're like, oh, she was the general. She knew everything that was going on. She had an amazing memory. And then as soon as they start to use it, they were like, ah, and this was the problem with using her. She didn't actually give you information. She just asked questions. Oh, okay, cool. So the women were trash and the men were the ones keeping the family together. Ugh. Because, you know, patriarchy. That's how all healthy family dynamics work. That's literally her reasoning, too, for vampires is patriarchy. And you have to do it. You can't not do it because it's in the vampire's veins. So if you want to romance a vampire, you have to listen to him. Yes, and they're very protective. And you're not going to like it, but you have to get over that. Yeah, he doesn't need to get better. You have to do it. You have to change yourself. <sighs> And every time she tries to buck the system, it's always over dumb things that he was right about. And so it just creates this never ending cycle of, well, you should have just listened to him because he was right women and so it's gross it's honestly really gross it's just over and over again whenever she bucks the system it's like oh diana you should stay in the house because they're trying to kidnap you and she's like oh okay immediately goes outside to get kidnapped <laughs> and on to the next section the kidnapping but before okay another plot hole that really really bugs me oh boy let's hear it this entire point vampires don't sleep right mm-hmm Vampires don't sleep. Even the chapter before, it's like, oh, Matthew is the only one that has a comfortable mattress because they're like, oh, we don't sleep. It doesn't matter. Which also begs the question, why do you have beds in the first place? Yeah. Waste of space. You can't just go stretch out in your bed and enjoy it. Edward had it right. You didn't need a bed. You need a big piano. Gigantic piano. Just get a day bed, like a couch, something comfy to sit on. You don't need an entire bed. Anyway, but... When it's convenient and they need Matthew to not be constantly stalking her so she can get kidnapped, he is asleep. She wakes up and he is asleep. It was his time to sleep like the dead. And then later on in section three, when they're at the ants and they're expecting vampire company and they're like, oh, we better make the beds. Diana specifically says vampires don't sleep. we will take a bed anyway, just for funsies. But Matthew sleeps when it's the important and convenient for the plot and dangerous for diana so she gets kidnapped and honestly the scene reminds me of bella in the ballet studio oh my gosh yes and then she has ptsd over it and fair but i don't know it wasn't that emotional of an a scene fair enough yeah so i didn't really connect to it yeah and so they get her back she has to be rescued something about her parents being like i have to keep you safe until you find your prince which is a little of course gotta keep rescuing her if that was gonna be the story okay just be honest that that was the story you know a little weird just be honest if you want a damsel in distress at no point has peach ever been like oh i'm not a damsel in distress just own that role it's fine just own the role it is a trope it's a tired trope so a lot of people are tired of it but if you do it well it's still a valid trope but no yeah, if that's what you want to do, that's what you want to do. No shame. But just be honest, man. Yeah, don't try to hide it behind all this strong woman. This mirror trickery to get the feminist to be on your side. And then be like, ha ha, JK. And then there's this whole emotional blackmail that she does on him. Because he has a bunch of secrets. And apparently that's a vampire thing. I remember when Hamish was like, you can't keep secrets from her. Yeah, and so it's, it's emotional. And as someone who's very guarded, I get that that. It's not so much you're keeping secret. I don't like how they tried to make it be, oh, you're purposely keeping secrets. It's a trust thing. You have to gain trust over time in the relationship to be like, okay, it is safe for me to share this with
with you. Yeah, like, I'm not going to just spill all my secrets two days into knowing you. Yeah, I didn't like how that was framed. And then she comes up to him and she's like, you can't keep secrets anymore. You have to tell me everything. In fact, I already know about your dead kid and these other super painful memories you have. So you have to trust me now. That's how that works, obviously. I would kick her out of the castle. I would banish her to the congregation. I would just walk up to their doorstep and deliver her. Here you go. Be like, here you go. You can have her. Have fun. She just demands to be let into the world of vampires and she's just not owning up to her part and being part of the witches. And it would have been so much better if she was just a 17 year old human wanting to be a vampire instead of a 35 year old witch. Just become a vampire. Solve all our problems. Yeah. And even the book's like, hey, you could solve a lot of problems if you were just a freaking vampire. Yeah, you could solve a lot of problems by being a vampire. Pretty much the whole entire series, but you know, her book. No, we can't because reasons? Yes. And then you find out that, okay, the break in the lab happens and then they also broke into Diana's room because they were looking for her DNA. And you find out over halfway through the book, Diana apparently flushes her hair. Every time she brushes her hair, she cleans out the hairbrush and flushes it, but also her nail clippings. But can't be good for your pipes. Fair, accurate, valid. But my point is, we heard about every meal, every conversation, every thought, every exercise that happened in Oxford. But at no point was the author like, and I flushed my hair down the toilet. Yeah. Oh, huh, here's this fun little thing I forgot to mention. Ha <laughs> So quirky. So convenient. You couldn't have gone back and added one scene where she mentions that and you can be like, oh, that's why she does it. Nope. No. Too busy focusing on walking with her eyes closed and thinking about a table. That's the important part. The important part. More emotional blackmail where she's like, hey, it's dangerous for you to be around a hunting vampire and she's like no you have to take me on a hunt i have to be there to experience it why it's really not that fun for you it doesn't make sense you could live your entire life as a witch you'd be like hey i'm gonna go hunt and you'd be like cool babe gonna read this book here and the way it was explained it sounds like she would just be sitting there for hours yeah and it's really dangerous because he's hunting he's in active predator mode and you are prey but she wants to go experience it anyway like she demands it and i don't understand she's like a spoiled child sometimes it's her toxic trait among many others oh but remember she has the power of empathy she totally does side eye so he goes away to oxford and then he comes back and she's like oh i love you and he's like i love you too and then three days later he's like oh yeah that means we're married all because we said i love you what and so she's rightfully confused but then she just goes with it yeah if someone was like haha we're married now i'd be like when did that happen like, excuse me? Yeah, we just said I love you to each other, but uh, I feel like a little bit more consent is needed. That's all it was. And she's dumb for not knowing it. And then, okay, so you can maybe explain this to me because I don't understand. And no one I've talked to understands. Remember in the content warning where I'm like, sex, it doesn't happen, but it's close enough. Oh, gosh. She gets really sexually graphic randomly. She does. I did notice that. I was like, okay, this is coming out of left field. But she goes out of her way to be like, but we don't have sex. I don't know. It feels kind of like chastity preachy. It does. I wondered why it was like that. Like if it was just author's personal choice that she didn't want to write those scenes or if publishing company was like, it was very reminiscent of purity culture. But she basically does graphic scenes of him giving her a hand job and also them fooling around. It, which, by the way, you can tell it's written for the female pleasure because it's very detailed about what he does to her but it glosses over what she does to him oh yeah. know your audience for sure i was like hmm, that was interesting but yeah it's not that i wanted to read the really awkward sex scenes but why stop at third base yeah at some point you just gotta go all the way it's not even like a, oh no sex until marriage kids they're married and he's like oh we can't consummate our love because reasons i honestly could not explain to you what his reasonings are i, I don't know Oh, it's weird. 
weird. But that continues for the rest of the book. So they're married, but they don't consummate their marriage. But she is very sexually explicit about the other things that they do. But no sex. That's not a slow burn. There is no burn. It's just confusing. Yeah. So yeah, after she gets kidnapped, they're like, hey, maybe we should go talk to witches finally. So they take his private jet and they go to America. And also apparently Matthew has an older brother. So even though the mom was like, hey, we have to listen to Matthew because he's the head of the household. Nope, there's an older brother named Baldwin who's actually the head of the household. Surprise! Except Matthew is in charge of the night order, so it doesn't actually matter. That was such a really weird dick measuring contest. It really was. I was like, why well, I'm uncomfortable. It was dumb and pointless, but okay. We are in America now. Here we are. So, I actually like the America section, mainly because things happen. Diana tries to do stuff. There's an interesting plot line about a haunted house. The house was possibly my favorite character. I really enjoyed the house. That's inventive. Everything else wasn't, but this is cool. It sort of reminded me of the house in Mikanto. Yeah, I could see that. How it just pops up random rooms and like, oh, where did it show up this time? Who's coming to visit? Which was another scene that was really random. To skip forward to talk more about the random dialogue, there's a vampire and we're going to come back and talk about all that. Diana kills the vampire. The next day, Diana's like, I want to go to the site where she was murdered. And her aunt just walks in and she's like, hey, there's another room. So someone's coming to visit. And they're like, oh my gosh, let's go check out the room. Where is it? Oh, wow. That's so cool. Anyway, back to visiting the place where I murdered someone. <laughs> yeah, just like, oh, a little side tracking. <laughs> Why did you write it in this order? Yeah, I'm just going to throw this in before I forget it. Matthew flips. The first section, he was trying to convince Diana to use her magic. In the second section, she was like, I'm not going to force her to do anything she's not ready for. And so when the mom's like, hey, it would be super convenient if she learned how to use her powers, he gets pissy at her. But then he comes to America and is pissy at the ants for not teaching her magic. Yeah. And this is after the point where he knows she's spellbound, so it wouldn't have even mattered. Matthew, make your mind up. She wouldn't have wanted to. Yeah, they couldn't have. Yeah, and so a bunch of scenes where the witches can't teach her crap, but Matthew can help her open her third eye and learn how to time walk and blah, 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 blah. There's also a scene where Diana almost murders her aunt over a very small quarrel. Yes. I was like, girl. I don't understand the family dynamic. Straight up witch fire where it's like, oh, nothing can stop it from burning. And she was just going to launch that at her aunt. Totally normal family argument. It was over nothing. Totally normal argument that you would just want to set your aunt on fire. Murder her. Yep. That's a totally well-adjusted human response. Okay. <laughs> There's also this whole plot line with the parents. That actually gets interesting. There's actually interesting things happening. Finally. The house has a habit of stealing things and then randomly giving them back, which I love. I thought that was pretty funny. Not going to lie. The house is my favorite character, which is a shame that the house is probably not in the next book. I know. But they find... An I forgot about this at this point, honestly. In the beginning of the book, she finds the enchanted book and she's like, hey, there are pages missing. And so we're at the very end and the house gives them one of the pages and you find out that it was sent to the parents when Diana was like around three. And it's like, oh, that's really cool. Mysterious. Who is sending this? Why are they sending this? Who is just ripping pages out of an old book? That couldn't have been opened. Lost for hundreds of years. So I was like, hmm, what is going on? But then they have this huge argument about whether or not the page was used as a call, which is basically... Okay, so I could be wrong, but it's something along the lines of she was born, but she was still in the sack. And apparently that's lucky for witches or whatever. And so to preserve that, some people would use paper, like press against it and save that. And they all have this conversation about whether or not this page was used for that. And I'm confused because they got the page when she was three. We just talked about that. She was not in a call 
school when she was three. No, that would be weird. I don't know. I thought like we were at the point where editing was just not on. The editor was just like, please. The editor was just there for grammar and punctuation. It's not about plot holes. Not anymore. They got tired of it. They're like, you know what? This isn't my job anymore. This can be someone else's. Yeah. And then there's actually a really cool couple scenes where they're puzzling out what the pages mean, what the symbols mean. What about the other two pages? What about the symbols on this page? What other things could be in the book? Why was she able to bring up the book one time, but not? I was like, that's what this book should have been this entire time. Yes, exactly. She should have been researching the things that she did see and getting other books and learning. They should have gone to France because they wanted to tap into Matthew's library to learn stuff. How much cooler would that have been to be like, oh, we have to go to my library. But my mom, drama, I am here for it. But they have to be there because they have to solve the mystery of this book. No, because they have to run away from a wizard that's vaguely threatening. Yeah, that would have been such a good book if that's how it had been the whole time. It would have been so good. It shows off her competencies of she is a PhD of history and she knows this stuff, but Matthew lived through it. I'm wondering if the second and third book will be that way. That would be so much better. I'm worried. That's my problem. I'm not emotionally ready to be let down again. We have time. It's okay. And then it gets weird again (laughs) it's been weird but then it gets weird first of all she was a twin oh my gosh yeah and apparently she absorbed her twin and now she's a chimera which chimera is actual thing it's actually pretty interesting i think that was why they had the swab because that didn't match her blood and it was coming back as a male and so that's why they were like oh she's a chimera and so she absorbed the twin and let me just read the passage diana so i was a twin and my mom miscarried my sibling matthew your brother your twin was male in cases like yours the viable fetus absorbs the blood and tissues of the other it happens quite early and in most cases there's no evidence of the vanished twin does diana's hair indicate she might possess powers that didn't show up in her other dna results another scientist named marcus a few time walking shape-shifting divination diana fully absorbed most of them diana my brother was supposed to be a time walker not me this is weird so after the initial what is happening shock of that all i could think about was the office (laughs) when the same thing happens with dwight and he's like now i have all the powers of a grown man and a baby (laughs) (laughs) oh my gosh Yes. Perfect. So yeah, apparently she was supposed to be a twin. They keep making Diana references and I'm actually really mad about it. Only because Diana was one of the virgin goddesses and actually had a lot of man-hating cults. But Diana's obsessed with a man and subservient. But yeah, she's totally the goddess. You couldn't have been Aphrodite. Hera? Hera would have been a great one. (laughs) That would have been more appropriate. Matthew doesn't have to be Zeus, but she was obsessed validly but also maliciously oh you know who would have been perfect persephone (gasps) yes she's persephone he's hades she's being dragged down into his darkness they keep calling him the dark he's dark blah 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 blah. even though he's pasty as anything else (laughs) also all vampires have black hair except for marcus has blonde hair yeah do their hair change colors when they are turned into a vampire but they're all pale. Yeah. And I have questions. Anyway, anyway, we're not going to go on my rant about how vampires being pale is actually counterproductive to evolution. <laughs> It is, though. But yeah, if she had been Persephone, that would have been so much better than Diana. It would have made more sense. The virgin huntress with man-hating cults who would go into the woods and hate men. That's all I'm saying. Not this Diana. Not this Diana. But yeah, that was the reference. It's like, oh, Diana and Apollo. Except she absorbed Apollo and his powers. Yes. So I have questions. I have so many questions. (laughs) 
so here's the next part. So the picture they get is a step in the alchemical process of making the Philosopher's Stone. Specifically, it's a marriage between mercury and sulfur. But apparently there's a next step. I'm going to read this part too. The Sun King and Moon Queen, philosophical sulfur and mercury, married and conceived a child. In alchemical imagery, the resulting child is a hermaphrodite to symbolize a mixed chemical substance. Random vampire. In other words, Matthew, the book is not just about origins, nor is it just about evolution and extinction. It's about reproduction. Diana, nonsense, random vampire. You may think it's nonsense, Diana, but it's clear to me. Vampires and witches may be able to have children together after all. So might other mixed partners. Because that's totally what we've been doing this whole time. Ant, but vampires can't reproduce biologically. They've never been able to, and different species can't mix like that. Random vampire. Species change, adapting to new circumstances. The instinct to survive through reproduction is a powerful one, certainly powerful enough to cause genetic changes. What is happening? When did this become? Why? Why? What is happening? When did this become a we're gonna have kids trilogy? Now we're obsessed with Matthew and Diana having a baby even though they won't even have sex? That's the logical next step now that they're married. Even though she didn't consent to this marriage, but whatever. Matthew, vampires and witches are not spadefoot toads. And not all of the changes that result are positive of crossbreeding. Random vampire, why are you so resistant? Okay, first of all, gross. Cross-species breeding is the next evolutional step. Genetic sub-combinations like those that would occur if a witch and vampire were to have children lead to accelerated evolutionary developments. All species take such leaps. It's your own findings we're reporting back to you, Matthew. Is it just me or is that creepy? Yeah, I was uncomfortable with that scene, like many others. It's really creepy when anyone talks about, hey, so when are you having kids? But then for them to be like, the prophecy states that you must have children together. And like, it's ew. Oh, yes. Yet another choice being made for her. Oh, you have to do this. The species must go on. <laughs> yeah, it's uncomfy. Matthew, because she's a chimera and AB positives as well, she may be less likely to reject a fetus that's half vampire. Because that makes sense. These are the random vampires, not Marcus. She's a universal blood recipient and has already absorbed foreign DNA into her body. Like the spade foot toad, she might have been led to you by the pressures of survival. Matthew, that's a heck of a lot of conjecture, random vampire. Diana is different, Matthew. She's not like other witch i'm not like other girls that's what it says she's not like other witches <laughs> she's not like other girls i'm not like other girls i'm different <sighs> well once again they decide not to have sex and so they're just gonna ignore that yeah so that doesn't come to any sort of conclusion whatsoever it's just out there in the universe that's just out there in the lore in the universe their next great decision is oh well we can't hide anywhere in the world so instead we're gonna hide in time that's an interesting take but why though because plot i feel like we're avoiding things and not confronting things and then they turn it around like oh it's okay because my dad was a time walker and went back in time and he's the one who enchanted the book in the first place so we just need to go back in time and get the book and there's this really random thing where Matthew's like hey Marlo was in love with me? Yeah very weird. That's just randomly thrown out there. Matthew what were you doing then? But that's the time period they're going to and Matthew's super secretive about the time period they're going to? Because keeping secrets is what they do. Duh. She's going Going to be there. I didn't understand where he had to be like, no, I'm not going to tell you until Halloween. Also, when they go back in time, are they going to run into a second Matthew? I don't know how time travel works. I have been informed by the person that recommended this book that she likes how they handled it. I don't know. The brief explanation they give is it's like changing cars in a train. 
I don't know what that means. So I could not tell you. But they, yeah, they're going to time travel now. And they're going to go way back in time to Marlowe and all that jazz. And she has to give a bunch of vaccines because apparently Sarah and M never got her vaccinated <laughs> for anything. Yeah. Which it would be one thing if she was like, oh, I hate shots. I'm not looking forward to this. But she was like, straight up, I don't want these. And Matthew was like, shut up. You're taking them in the way because you get no choices because you're a silly little woman. And like I said, every time she fights him, he's really obviously right. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Blah, blah, blah. Everyone leaves. Oh, yeah. Damon's shown up. And then <sighs> she spends a chapter just talking about contracts oh yeah an entire chapter about diana signing over power of attorney and creating a will and actually getting a marriage certificate finally and i appreciate the realism but also why it's fantasy chill yo we didn't need this expanded into an entire chapter. Just be like, and homicide or sign over power of attorney and blah, 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 but no. Unnecessary details is what we do. That's the subtitle of this book. Yep. And whatever. Everyone leaves and they're like, hey, we're gonna do trick or treat stuff. And Matthew's actually really cute with kids. So point. Yeah, that was good. Also, Di once again, hates her aunts. And instead of wanting to say goodbye to them, she wants to say goodbye to Matthew's mom. Yeah, because that's her favorite person now. Because that is her family. That is home. What did they do? I don't understand this family dynamic. That's very strange. As someone who understands toxic family members and the need to cut them off, I don't understand the family dynamics here. Yeah, it makes no sense. The aunts seem genuinely lovely, caring people. Little overbearing, little backwards. So is his mom. Yeah. But it's okay. But it's okay because it's not her aunt. Because she has horses. <laughs> the horse girl really just won out this time. Yep. And then, yeah, then they go back in time. The end. Ew. We survived. I knew I was going to rant a lot. It's fine. <laughs> this is going to be a long episode. Have fun editing that. Oof. <laughs> Lots of feelings. It's fine. So a couple of my general thoughts. I wasn't expecting this to be a contemporary fantasy, which could have been fun, but wasn't. Yeah, no. It had so much potential. I, I wasn't expecting contemporary either. Like, I was expecting way back. Stereotypical fantasy. Yeah. The first eight chapters were straight up from a scrapped romance game where you could date vampires. <laughs> It did have that feeling, didn't it? It was straight up from a dating sim. Oh my goodness. And then it just got worse. <laughs> it just went all downhill from there. So the rest of the trilogy can only go up from here, right? No. And that's the problem. No trust. Diana's already such a basic bee with no female friends. Because they're competition and she's not like other girls. Needs constant male protection and guidance. Yes. Who does nothing and is nothing and things just happen to her. Oh yeah, that was sorry. I didn't go back to the vampire that she murdered. Oh yeah. Once again, could have been so cool. But it was not. Matthew's ex-girlfriend, y'all. Ah, uh, jealousy. Super powerful. Matthew's quote unquote son hates her, thinks she's manipulative. She comes in, she's super power game playing. And then, no, she just listens to what men tell her to do. And she's also psycho crazy. Because she's his crazy ex, duh. She could have been so cool. Why? A woman does not need a tragic backstory caused by men to be a villain. They can just be villains. They can just be villains. She could have just been a manipulative, terrible person, but it's also super strong and awesome. That's fine. No, meeting her was an extreme disappointment. It really was. Also, the son describes her the first time you ever hear about her, and he calls her mixed race vampire. And I was just like, mixed human? race or mixed creature races and then you learn at the end it's like oh no one's ever mixed creatures before and so you're like what does mixed race mean <laughs> why was that necessary you have the sprinkle of diversity that was weird that was the only black character too yeah which leaves a weird taste in my mouth she wasn't even fully black 
I guess. I don't know. I'm not going to claim to understand. There's enough of misogyny to chew on. I'm not even going to. I'm tired. (laughs) (laughs) I'm just tired. There's some subtext there. You could dig into that, I'm sure. I'm just tired. Ugh. And their entire relationship is not, oh, let's trust each other. It's just trampling boundaries on each other until they give up. Keeping secrets. Emotional blackmail. It's fine. Both of them. Like, Diana sets a boundary. Matthew's like, you're not allowed to have that. And then Matthew sets boundaries and she's like, no, you're not allowed to have that back and forth and back and forth. They also threw around the word brave and courage a lot. (laughs) Where? When they actually mean ignorant and reckless. And the audacity. (laughs) The audacity. They call Diana brave a lot. There's like, oh, she's so brave. She's so courageous. She's so brave. No, she's dumb. She's just stupid. Ignorant and reckless. Yes. Bravery implies doing something brave, not just being willfully ignorant. So in Happier News, do you want to hear my theories about why vampire books like this always seem to interest young white females, most likely with a religious background? Yes. And I mainly thought about Twilight for this because it blew up and took over the world and then vampires were freaking everywhere. Yes. Obviously not everyone, but a lot of the people that I've talked to who also went through a vampire phase do meet those demographics. Oh my god, yeah. There's something in the, oh my gosh, he's super attracted to me, but oh my gosh, he could kill me. And I think it mainly leans onto that religious background part where losing your virginity is a form of death. So there's some really confusing, especially when you're a young hormonal teenager, there is a really confusing line between the I'm going to kill you sexual tension. That makes a lot of sense. Because it's like, oh, I want you so badly. Because it's always like, I am obsessed with your blood. Yes. So it's like, oh, I'm so attracted to you and I love you so much, but I'm trying not to hurt you and I'm trying not to kill you for your blood. And so it's the religious, oh my gosh, I love you so much, but I don't want to take your virginity from you. But also the girl's like, please. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I've never thought about that, but that's a good theory. So this is my running theory. And... I think it's this book too. Even though it's a 35-year-old woman who has had sex before, so she's not a virgin, but the whole, oh, we can't consummate our love. Everyone makes love that's so robotic. I don't remember how he describes it, but it's like, oh, they just go through the motions of it. It's not about love, blah, 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 blah. That sounds like some religious talk to me. Deborah, girl, have you considered therapy? (laughs) I think you would benefit from it and you have the money to afford it. I don't know. There's just some interesting undertones in this book. Like I said, it feels really derivative of Twilight. Girl meets vampire. Vampire's obsessed with her blood specifically. He goes out of his way to stalk her and watch her and break into her house. Watches her sleep. Becomes absolutely obsessed with her. Starts running her life. Takes her away from her friends and family to hang out with his family. His family becomes her new family. No one likes that they're together, but eventually the family is all for it. Sadly, this book doesn't have cool vampire powers. I'm just saying, that was a really cool part of Twilight. Yeah, some cool vampire powers would have been really neat. But, alas, there is a government organization that does not condone their relationship. Because of their relationship, Bella, sorry, (laughs) the main character gets kidnapped and there is a prolonged torture scene. Which, weirdly enough, that was a really good climax for Twilight, but this book was like, nah, let's put it in the middle. Yeah, it would have been so good towards the end. That would have been too obvious. This is true. It would have been a little too obvious that she was totally inspired by Twilight. Also, you find out in Midnight Sun, there was this whole time where Edward would feed on people, but he would only feed on criminals. Oh, yeah. And they mentioned that Marcus had to give a reason. Yeah. Matthew is the same way. He's like, you only feed on criminals. I haven't read Twilight in a really long time, so I don't know if it's mentioned in Twilight that that happened. I can't remember. So I don't know if that happened before or after, but it was just another parallel. I don't know how valid that is, but it is something else. There are no werewolves, alas. That would have been so nice. I would have been happy. But they are going to have a half-vampire baby. At some point, yeah. 
That's really coming up. Also, she has to beg him to sleep with her, even though they're married. Yeah, which is a little weird. And Stephanie Myers absolutely does have a really religious background. Mm-hmm. So I don't know what Deborah Harkness's background is. Maybe she's the same way. I feel like she's got to be religious. I feel like she at least had to have been around religious ideology a lot. Because, like I said, there's some subtext. Oh, yeah. Lots of it. So, yeah. That's the book. That's the book. (laughs) I have ranted. And now I am tired. We survived. Only two more to go. Oh, gosh. One question for the author. I want to know why she didn't talk about demons more. Oh my gosh, yes. They're the most interesting ones because they focus really strongly, like really strongly on vampires and they kind of focus on witches. Demons are given the base. Hey, these are what they are. That was my same question. I was like, why weren't there more demons? Because they are kind of my favorite. They're the most interesting. Yes, exactly. I can't think of any equivalent in any book I've read. Such a creative concept that you do jack all with. (sighs) And I don't trust the other books. I have trust issues now. That's what this is. Trust issues. Trust issues, the book. It's sad. Yeah. You meet Hamish, who's a demon, and then you meet... Agatha, who talks to Diana briefly in Oxford. And then there are no demons in the second portion. And then there are no demons in the third until the very end. Hamish shows up and two other ones show up randomly. And they kind of talk, but they're not what the stereotypes are at all. The stereotype is the tortured artist. Yeah, borderlines on crazy. Hamish is a business leader. A successful one. And he's the one who's like, power of attorney, letter to Yale, letter to Oxford, marriage certificate. He's got his stuff down. I don't know. We could have talked about them more. Do they have a longer lifespan? What is going on? Do they live normal human life? Do they live longer? What makes them different than humans. Yes, besides the half a chromosome or whatever they get. Rating. I got Stockholm Syndrome out of 10. Um, fair. Also, Holy Red Flags Batman out of 10. (laughs) I gave it cheap Halloween decorations out of 10. Yes, that's a good. You tried. A for effort. And if you're a college student who's honest about shopping at the dollar store because you're poor, it's fine. Uh Uh-huh. But don't tell me you have the best house on the block and all you can manage is some cheap webbing. That's clearly the best house on the block. Would you read it again? No. No. I didn't want to finish it. If I wasn't doing it for the podcast, I probably would have gotten to around maybe Paris. Probably would have quit a little bit before then. Yeah. And just put it back on the shelf and been like, that was boring. I feel like you're going to upset some people because some people really liked this book, judging by the Goodreads. It is so baffling. Some people loved it and some people hated it and oh boy. Yeah, but I also read the reviews and sometimes you read a book and you're like, yeah, it wasn't for me. Yeah. I was not the demographic. That's fair. These people liked it. Yeah. But yeah, no, you're right. On Goodreads, it's so split and I've read some of the reviews because normally it's like, okay, yeah, the bad reviews, you have some points. The good reviews, you have some points. Yeah, there was no overlap in these reviews. I was like, oh my gosh. I feel like they read two separate books. Truly. The people who loved it, I don't understand. I tried. I don't understand. It's a very polarizing book, I guess. Yeah. It'll be interesting to see if the next two are as polarizing. And that's what I wonder. Is the next two just so good that everyone gives it a pass? But I, so I feel like if the people who really hate this book are going to read the first one and not continue. Yeah. And so it would make sense that the later ones have higher ratings, but I don't know. I could not understand where people were coming from who are like, I love this book. What mindset are you in? What's happening in your life? We didn't read the same book. But have you read this book? Do you think you're a witch, vampire, or demon? Do you have any book recommendations for us? Tell us all about it in the comments below. If you like the video, hit like. And if you're enjoying yourself, hit subscribe for more. Thank you for exploring a discovery of witches with us. I'm Sam Reiner. And I'm Hannah Rossell. And we hope to see you and a friend here next time. Escape With Me Book Club is a Lunar Skulk production. Check us out on TikTok or Instagram to keep up to date with us. Lunar underscore S-K-U-L-K.